So while for me, it would seem as though time was passing perfectly normally, for me, sitting on the pavement, assuming I could somehow peer inside the tram, time would assume a totally different quality. Looking in from the outside, I'd sense that time on board the tram was passing much more slowly. That's because, according to Einstein, the faster an object moves, the slower its time will run to someone observing from the sidelines. In other words, time can vary. It's all a matter of speed. And that explains the mystery of how our muons reach the Earth. Because muons travel near the speed of light, relative to the Earth, their clocks have slowed down, so much so that they exist long enough to reach the Earth and be detected. Time for our muons has stretched. It beats very differently to the way it does for us. For hundreds of years, time had been seen as fixed and immutable. None other than the grandfather of modern science, Sir Isaac Newton, had pronounced that time exists in and of itself without reference to anything external. But we now know that time isn't set at a fixed rate. Time is not absolute. Now, the effects of special relativity are so small that they have no impact on our daily lives. But the fact that they are there at all has changed everything. Because if time is relative, if time is flexible, then our belief in the immutability of time is wrong. And if we can be wrong about something as basic and as fundamental as this, then in what other ways might we be mistaken? Time has intrigued humanity throughout history. More than 1,500 years ago, a former heretic turned Christian bishop wrote a treatise on time that's as provocative today as when it was first written. What we have here is the first English translation of Augustine's Confessions. Augustine was a 4th century philosopher and theologian, and the Confessions is his autobiography. But besides relating incidents in his life, it also contains some fascinating reflections on the nature of time. And he starts with a very commonplace reflection, that time consists of time past, time present, and time future. But, says Augustine, the future does not yet exist, the past no longer exists, and the present takes up no time at all. So how, then, can time exist? Over one and a half thousand years later, the mysteries of time continue to preoccupy philosophers. But there's one thing most of them are in agreement about. Time is very paradoxical. It involves notions of eternity, of infinity, of beginnings and endings. All these are extremely difficult notions to grasp. But that doesn't mean to say that we have to banish temporal order. It seems to me that we can still make sense of time as being an ordered dimension of events. Even philosophers accept that time is predictable and ordered, that things can only be in one place at one time. Cards? Um, I play a little poker. You play poker? No. So you, you can shuffle cards, can you? Oh, no, no. No? I let someone else So shuffle. do you shuffle like this? Yeah. Yeah? That's called the overhand shuffle. Okay. Because if you don't shuffle cards that well, you can try and try this one. This one's pretty good. It makes a complete mess of the deck of cards. Some cards go back to face, but some of them are like back to back. Our complete trust in temporal order is the reason why we delight in the obvious impossibility of magic tricks. Back to face, you face to back. 
the centre of it. It's a total mess. I'll just show you. Some of the cards there, like face to back. Not very good for playing poker or blackjack. But if you press the button here, if you press the button, oh, snap your fingers. They all come out the right way, which is rather handy. Yeah, that's that's pretty so good. cool, isn't it? Pretty good. Wow. <laughs> My job as a magician is to manipulate people's faith. Hi. How are you doing? I can stop you for a moment. People realise that things can't disappear and reappear. I'm going to run through the cards, and you say stop wherever you like. If you do your job properly, you can make it look as though two things can be in the same place at the same time. And to that end, essentially, you can make it look as though you're manipulating space and time. Have you ever seen magicians use these before? Yep, I've yeah? seen them. I'll show you a trick with two of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you hold a hand out for yeah, me? Sure. A classic way of demonstrating the manipulation of space and time can be done using the sponge ball trick. It's 100 years old, but it's great. But essentially, you take a ball in your own hand, and the spectator holds a ball, and you can do it in such a way that you can look as though you can manipulate space of time, and it looks as though the ball has disappeared from your hand, so when the spectator opens their hand, suddenly they have two. That ball has vanished from your hand and it's reappeared in theirs. But believe it or not, this sort of behavior isn't always an illusion. Beneath the surface of our common sense world lies another world, where magical things really do happen, where the impossible can be made real, and where time can perform the most incredible tricks. That place is inside the atom. For years, scientists had assumed that in our universe, there was nothing smaller than an atom. The very word atom, in fact, comes from the Greek word for indivisible. Then in 1897, an Englishman named J.J. Thompson made an astounding discovery that inside the atom, there were even smaller particles called electrons. Thompson's discovery opened the door to the amazing world inside the atom, a world where everything, including time, behaves in a truly alien fashion. Physicist Ian Walmsley has been studying this microscopic world for almost 30 years. When we get inside the atom to this world of subatomic particles, the ideas that we have about the way the world works completely have to change. We can't think in the same sorts of common sense terms that we think of in everyday experience. In fact, this subatomic universe is so strange that time becomes chaotic. A startling discovery that emerged from the study of light. Light consists of individual particles called photons, known for their wave-like properties. Waves have a very interesting sort of phenomenon. It's called interference. When two waves come together, they can add together and reinforce one another, or they can cancel one another out. And this interference is a ubiquitous property of all waves, not just water waves, but also light waves. But in the early 1900s, scientists noticed something very odd about these light waves, something that proves that time isn't always ordered. In this reworking of a classic experiment, once described as the most beautiful in physics, single photons, or particles of light, are fired down a darkened tube towards a camera, one at a time. So we have here a very simple apparatus. It consists of a light bulb at this end and a camera at the other end that can register the light. And in between, the light encounters a pair of slits etched onto this piece of glass through which the photons can pass on their way from the source to the camera. 